to start by talking about taking a photograph, which I'm sure we've all done a million times. And I'm going to look at the act of taking a photograph in four parts. And the first part is opening your eyes to what is present. In other words, when we want to photograph something, usually that's triggered by seeing something that for one reason or another we find beautiful, fascinating, curious, weird, or maybe it's just for a record of something that we, we, want, we want to have a good memory of. The next step in taking a photograph, and here I'm moving more into photography as an art, is that we need to let go of our habitual views and perceptions. Now I notice very often when I'm, let's say, on the beach, and there's a gorgeous sunset, and that almost invariably triggers people to get out their cameras and try to photograph the sunset. Or if you go to a famous cathedral in Europe, let's say Notre Dame, it'll be in front of it, you'll find loads of people with very expensive equipment photographing Notre Dame. But in many cases, what will result from that photograph will be uh, a cliche. Another sunset, another picture of Notre Dame, Frankly, it would be far more um, effective to buy a postcard. Uh, the photograph that you're going to take, and sometimes I notice people have equipment worth thousands of dollars, is they'll take a snapshot, and you might just as well have paid 50 cents for a much better image uh, at the uh, store of the cathedral or wherever it might, uh, might be. So when we're taking photographs um, as a practice of art, we try to somehow let go of all the cliches, all the um, derivative images that clutter our minds, all the beautiful images we've ever seen of sunsets. We put that away and we try to open ourselves totally to what is unique and distinctive in that moment in such a way that we let go, we um, detach ourselves from our preconceived ideas, our concepts, our, our ideas and whatnot. And at a certain point, we press the shutter. That's the third step. It's what Henri Cartier-Bresson, who's probably one of the great photographers of the 20th century, calls the decisive moment. And the fourth step is that we bring into being, through that decisive moment, an, unan an unanticipated image that reveals the world in a new light. A great photograph by, say, Cartier-Bresson is not just a record of a place or a sunset, but it enables the viewer to see that place, that object, in a new way, in a new light. I've been practicing photography since I was about 15 or 16 years old. And what I strive for is to be able to be open to the world in a way that's not clouded by preconceived ideas, in a way in which I'm not trying to derivatively produce an image that I admire from someone else's work, but to be able to tune myself to that moment and press the shutter, and in doing so, release into the world a photograph in which that thing is seen in a new way. This is a quotation from Cartier-Bresson himself. To take photographs, he said, is to hold one's breath when all faculties converge in the face of fleeing reality. It is putting one's head, one's eyes, and one's heart on the same axis, 
It is a way of freeing oneself, not of proving or asserting one's originality. It is a way of life. It's interesting that Cartier-Bresson, um, particularly towards the end of his life, was a practicing Tibetan Buddhist. Um, and the last photographs he took before he died were actually a series of images of young Tibetan tulkus. Uh, he lived in France. He was very close with uh, the family of Mathieu Ricard and others. I saw him once from a distance at a gathering with the Dalai Lama, but I was too nervous to introduce myself, and he was my great hero, really. And for Cartier-Bresson, uh, the camera wasn't just... Um, a technical device whereby we can record images. He defined the camera as an instrument of intuition and spontaneity. And I think this has quite a lot to say about technology. Um, we don't tend to think of a camera as an instrument of intuition and spontaneity. Uh, it's a, a piece of machinery, but in the hands of uh, an artist, it allows us to uh, transform our image, our understanding of the world and reveal it anew. In other words, the imagination and creativity come very much into play. Obviously, to become a photographer, you need to acquire um, a certain discipline, you require a great deal of technical skill, and in the same way, if you, for example, were a painter or a writer or a pianist, you have to spend a lot of time doing a lot of boring stuff in order that you can use the technology and you're no longer conscious of the technology. It becomes an instrument um, that's almost, as uh, the lady was saying last night, uh, a part of your own body. And but the thing is, simply to have the technical skill does not guarantee that um, your photograph will produce, or your photography, I'm sorry, will produce a work of great art. And to me, this is similar with the practice of meditation. Um, one might have achieved considerable technical skill in certain meditative uh, disciplines, but simply to have achieved those skills is not a guarantee that your practice will give rise to great wisdom uh, or to great love. And in some ways, I find it interesting that the aspects of meditation that we um, consider more from, let's say, a scientific or neuroscientific point of view tend to be those elements of meditation that we can learn. Mindfulness, concentration in particular, these are, as it were, technical skills. Uh, we've mentioned the word and inner technologies quite a lot during these last few days. And of course, there are um, ways described in considerable detail that enable us to become proficient in certain meditative skills and technologies. But I find it very difficult to imagine how simply mastering those skills will in any way be a guarantee of becoming more wise, becoming more loving, becoming more compassionate, becoming more engaged with the suffering of other people. It seems that these qualities are in some sense uh, meta-technical. Whether it's photography or whether it's meditation, um, we need to go beyond mere expertise, mere expertise uh, in these domains. We require a capacity to see the world in another way. And the pursuit of meditation and photography has led me away from fascination with the extraordinary. The, there were times, particularly when I was a young monk, when I saw the, the goal of meditation as arriving at deep, 
uh, non-conceptual, mystical insights into the nature of reality. Much in the same way that when taking photographs, I thought that what I was looking for in the world was some piece of scenery or some object that had in itself a kind of intrinsic fascination or interest, something very, very special. But in many ways, I found over time that my interest in uh, both meditation and photography has brought me back to a heightened understanding, uh, a fascination, a curiosity with the concrete, sensuous events of daily life. Um, I'm not interested anymore in uh, gaining some transcendent experience, but rather I'm far more interested in learning to be more fully attentive to what is happening in this moment right now. So the practice of photography um, over the years taught me to start paying much closer attention to what I see around me all the time. And I found that many of the photographs that I'm most uh, are happy with are those that are actually just taken of, uh, their images taken of things that I see every day, but which I don't notice. Um, we tend to overlook what's going on around us. Um, we tend to take so much for granted. Um, we don't actually see what's right before our eyes. And this sensibility is exactly the same that I found through my practice of awareness meditation, of mindfulness. It's not about arriving at some non-ordinary uh, state of consciousness or some special absolute truth or something, but rather to learn to be more fully present uh, to what is actually occurring here and now. So rather than a technique, I would understand meditation more as a sensibility, and a sensibility that originates and culminates in the everyday sublime. The everyday sublime, the sublime is a term much used in the Romantic tradition, and it has to do with those experiences of life which are both fascinating and in some sense terrifying. And I think a great deal of our lives are spent somehow protecting ourselves against the sublime. And I feel that meditation, awareness practices in particular, are practices in which we learn to divest ourselves of those habits of mind, those preconceptions, those fixed views, opinions, etc., etc., that actually obscure or somehow numb us or as Robert said this morning, anesthetize ourselves to the utterly extraordinary experience that we're having right now. I also work as a translator and a writer. And my career as a writer really began with my work in translating Tibetan texts. As soon as one gets involved in the practice of translation, one is obliged to engage the imagination. The tradition can, can help us a great deal in understanding what a particular term means, but it can't actually provide us with any help at all in finding uh, the most appropriate English word uh, to convey that idea. So to translate is unavoidably a process of interpretation, a process of what 
we were talking about this morning of innovation. We are having to um, take from one place, let's say a Tibetan text, into another place, a translation of that text into English, and the vehicle in which that translation occurs is that of the imagination. Translation literally means to carry something over from one place to another. As a translator, I've moved away from translating uh, classical texts, although that is still something I'm, I'm very much involved in, but I don't see it as my, my primary work anymore, to translating ideas. And so much of what we've been talking about over the last days is basically how do we translate a particular doctrine, a particular practice, a particular uh, element of Buddhist culture in the East, how do we translate that into a form of words, a form of images, uh, into some form of medium um, in which we successfully take it from a culture that was not our own, ancient Tibet or Japan or wherever, into the culture of our own time. Now, I feel that in many ways, it's not a question, therefore, of whether or not we should interpret classical teachings, but it's a question of how we should interpret classical teachings. We don't have a choice. The, as soon as we hear a teaching, we are in a way called upon to integrate and to bring that teaching into relevance for our own life in the 21st century. And that entails an act of the imagination. Now, very often, the traditional uh, teachers and doctrines and so forth can give us a great deal of support in finding uh, our own uh, voice in this way. But at a certain point, um, I feel that they can get in the way. In other words, there's a sort of uh, taboo against uh, taking this too far. And I feel this is a tension that is perhaps unavoidable at our present time. Buddhism has not yet found a form that is distinctively modern. We are in the process of um, moving from one Asian culture into modernity. And each of us is engaged in this process of translation. Buddhism, as I understand it, has survived through the ages, not because it has preserved something unchanging and uncorrupted. And that, I think, is often the myth of, uh, tra uh, of uh, traditional thought, is that somehow we've preserved something without any adaptation or change from what was uttered two and a half thousand years ago by the Buddha. And many of the traditions have developed polemics and rhetorics to somehow argue that what you're hearing now is exactly what the Buddha taught in 500 BC. And historical study um, or analysis of these lineages and traditions shows quite quickly that an enormous amount of transformation and change has gone on. And that um, we begin to understand when we look at the history of the Buddhist tradition, that it has been a constant process of reimagining the Dhamma. So Buddhism has survived, not because it's preserved something unchanging, but because it has succeeded on many different occasions, when it went to China, Tibet, Japan, in imagining itself differently. Traditional schools are rather uncomfortable about acknowledging that. But for us in the West, historical consciousness is inescapable. We cannot but see Buddhism 
as, as David Loy was mentioning this morning, as also characterized by the very features that it describes all other things as impermanent, as dukkha, Buddhism is in a sense imperfect, unsatisfactory, and at the same time, Buddhism is insubstantial. There is no essential Buddhism. There is no essence to Buddhism. And that can sometimes feel uncomfortable. In that regard, or in this regard, it seems to me that Buddhism is perhaps better compared to a living organism that over time evolves and adapts to new environments. And in that sense, just in the same way that you would find it very difficult to define what is the essence of an elephant, what is the essence of a butterfly, in the same way I don't think we can talk about the essence of Buddhism. It is a non-essentialist tradition. It's concerned with living processes that are continuously changing, evolving, and adapting, and cannot be reduced to a particular uh, state or a particular final definition of what it really is. And perhaps the best way in which this is illustrated traditionally is in the Buddha's parable of the elephant and the blind man. Uh, an elephant is brought into um, a place in the town, uh, the order of the king, and the king then invites the blind people of the town to um, come and tell him what this thing is. And so the person who touches the side of the elephant says, it's a wall. The person who touches the trunk says, it's a trumpet. I'm sure you all know this story. Um, but none of them are able to capture the totality of the elephant in its organic complexity. And Buddhism, I think, is like the elephant. Um, we become attached to little bits of it, and we think, well, that's what it really is. But we fail thereby to capture uh, the Dharma as a complex living organism that cannot be reduced to any one of its particular bits. Now, in this regard, um, when we bring into the equation the work of the imagination, and this happens at every period when the Dharma encounters another culture, um, and perhaps another political, economic, or other system, is that inevitably we have to imagine it otherwise. But the problem with the imagination is that it can be perceived as subversive. And in traditional religious institutions, not just Buddhism, but pretty much everywhere, the imagination tends to be controlled by those in power. In other words, those who have authority within the tradition, they are the ones who dictate what it is that Buddhism really is, what dogmas and beliefs are to be upheld, what forms um, of iconography, for example, can be um, regarded as legitimate. Um, and that constitutes a considerable part of the power and the authority of the orthodoxy or the church or the institution. The notion that one might creatively um, imagine the Dharma in another way is um, not even something that we can even find a language for in classical Buddhist languages. There's a term in Tibetan, for example, called rangzoa. Rangzoa means made by oneself. And that is always considered to be a term of um, abuse. The last thing that uh, the tradition wants is for you to somehow make up your own version of what it means. This is all about the need, often for very good motives, very good reasons perhaps, to conserve and to preserve the Dhamma. But I think the whole notion of preservation is deeply problematic. As I remember a conversation I had with Ken McLeod many years ago, 
where he said the only things that we preserve are things that are already dead. You know, apples or jam or uh, confit de, de, de canard or whatever it might be. What we preserve is already dead. Preservation is, I think, a non-living relationship to the tradition. Whereas imagining the Dharma um, otherwise is, I think, the lifeblood, the pulse of a living tradition. So often the imagination is something that is um, uh, permitted amongst those in authority. In other words, the, the abbot of the monastery can have a dream or a great uh, lama might produce a very original piece of art. But if your ordinary, unenlightened uh, follower exhibits any such tendencies to be imaginative or creative, they tend either to be ignored or dismissed. Um, or they're told very often, as I'm told, that you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> so the imagination, and I think this is very true at our times, is often felt to be threatening, that it um, challenges the authority and the power of those in charge. Now, obviously, we can see through the history of Buddhism that the Buddhist cultures have produced an extraordinary richness and variety of um, uh, of painting, of sculpture, of architecture, and so forth and so on. But what is striking, I find, is that with a few exceptions in Japan, um, Buddhists have not actually uh, thought about the process of creativity or imagination itself. And in fact, in most classical Buddhist languages, we don't even have a word for it. Creativity, imagination. There's no, or not yet, um, evolved a Buddhist aesthetics. In other words, a, a way of thinking about what constitutes the beautiful, what constitutes the sublime. And that, I wonder, may be a, um, a challenge that perhaps we can meet in modernity, is to arrive at a, a way of thinking about uh, aesthetics from a Buddhist perspective. I like to think that we might be able to um, cultivate a democracy of the imagination in which each individual practitioner, each individual uh, Buddhist community is empowered not just to um, to, to, to do certain practices or, or master certain philosophies, but also to imagine the Dharma in another way, both for the individual and also for the society itself. And in our, our own world, we find that, we very often find that uh, inspiration and, uh, and meaning are less present for us in uh, static uh, icons and religious um, archetypes and more found in the dramas of uh, theater and music and novels and films. Um, again, I feel that we, in the practice of the imagination, we will evolve forms that we would now consider um, maybe secular, uh, novelistic, or, what, or whatever. But through novels, for example, and I read a lot of novels, uh, and I'm very, very suspicious of the notion of Buddhist fiction or Buddhist art. I think as soon as you uh, label that artistic process as Buddhist, you have more or less killed it. That I feel a more useful way to think of this is to recognize that pretty much in all great artistic accomplishments, we find the world revealed to us in a new way that very often allows us to see precisely those elements that the Buddha 
asked us to pay attention to impermanence and death, the tragedy of life, um, the beauty of things, the insubstantiality of things, how a character in a novel is constantly evolving and changing and adapting and learning. There's not a sort of a fixed self or ego that remains static through the story, but in the course of the story, evolves and learns and adapts and changes. So a, doc, a democracy of the imagination would be one in which the, the mythological language um, would be brought down to earth and incarnated in individuated narratives. And this might liberate not only the creative impulses of each individual, but also of communities of practitioners, um, of sanghas, to envision afresh how they might tell the story of their own unfolding. Now, my brother um, is an artist. He, he lives and works in London. Um, and over the years, his partners um, have tended to be art historians or curators. And this has made me very aware of the distinction uh, between those two roles. Many years ago, in fact, the first book I, I uh, published was the, the translation of Shanti Deva's uh, Bodhicari Avatar, a guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life. And I spent in my early 20s, five years, as I learned Tibetan, uh, translating this text, you know, verse by verse. It's probably one of the most important things I ever did in my Buddhist practice. I was able to get very close, I feel, to the voice of this extraordinary uh, poet, teacher, philosopher, who we call Shanti Deva. But what arose out of that was an inspiration to be able to write something like that myself rather than to become a learned commentator or expert on the Bodhichari Avatara. In other words, um, my question is, do I want my Dharma practice to be like the practice of an artist or do I want my practice to be one like that of an art historian or a curator. And I have to confess that for me, I see my practice of the Dhamma as a practice of art. And I mean that in every way possible. That my uh, experience I see as, as, as the raw materials uh, for my art. I see my meditation practice, my study of Buddhist philosophy, my practice of writing um, and so forth as ways of, uh, of reimagining my own experience, of transforming my own experience into a new way of being and responding to this world. Another practice that I've been doing over the last 20 years is, the, um, uh, is work in collage. And this started um, basically by an interest in uh, noticing the things that our society and our culture dismiss and reject. In other words, litter and rubbish. And I've start, I've, I do this continuously. I, I've started training myself to notice, like for example, that piece of paper on the ground over there. I collect this stuff. I actually, just after lunch, I found a wonderful piece. <laughs> this is a piece of um, sticky tape plastic that was on a notice board out in the campus. Um, and it's got an incredible texture, a wonderful uh, uh, coloration, which I will glue onto a white piece of card, and then I'll organize and arrange that in ways uh, 
to create a kind of a mosaic, a kind of a, a, a formal composition. And this, again, I see as part of my Dharma practice. I see it as um, a way of exploring how the, the neglected and the abandoned and the dismissed and the ugly and litter can be recovered and transformed into what might be perceived as a piece of beauty, of something which has transcended its litter nature and become something else. I see my own writing very much in this same light. Um, I'm not so much interested in a, 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 a rather linear developmental narrative. Um, I'm interested in uh, juxtaposing ideas and stories, a uh, little bit like William Burroughs' cut-up technique. In other words, really fascinated by how things go or don't go together. Um, I'm fascinated by how bits of color and this sort of texture, te textured materials, when put in juxtaposition one with the other, bring out something new. So the Dhamma, as I understand it, um, is a, a body of impersonal ideas, and values and practices, again, like bits of stuff, that are creatively reimagined over time and brought into a different set of configurations. We have to remember that shortly before the Buddha died, um, he said on, on two or three occasions, um, and I'll just quote one of them, this is from the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, he says, after my death, Ananda, do not think you will not have a teacher. The Dhamma will be your teacher. Um, the Buddha could have used the word guru, but he didn't, at least in the Pali materials. That I feel that what was very distinctive about his approach is that he didn't see the teacher as an authority figure um, who imposed a kind of doctrine or orthodoxy on the students, but rather the teacher was a kalyanamita, a good friend, whose purpose was to lead the student into the Eightfold Path. And one of the characteristics of entering the Eightfold Path is that you become autonomous in your practice. You become aparapachaya, independent of others in the teaching. And that is a term, again, not widely spoken of in much Buddhist literature, but one, I think, that renders the Buddha's teaching as a path of, 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 of autonomy and independence. So for me, the practice of the Dharma has very little to do with adopting a set of metaphysical beliefs, and it has everything to do with applying a set of injunctions. In other words, Buddhism is not something that we learn to believe, but Buddhism is something that we learn how to do. So I've spent a lot of time in the last years trying to rethink what are called the Four Noble Truths as Four Noble Tasks. The, rather than thinking of you know, life is suffering or there is suffering, the origin of suffering is craving, to look, as the Buddha himself says at the conclusion of his uh, first discourse, that suffering or dukkha, I don't really like to translate this word, dukkha is something to be fully embraced, uh, craving or grasping is something to be let go of, the stopping of craving is something to be experienced for oneself, and the Eightfold Path is something to be created and cultivated. And that describes a process, a living process. Let's go back to where we began with the taking of a photograph. And how might this serve as an image of the practice of the Four Noble Tasks? 
opening your eyes to what is present, the first injunction of photography, I feel is very similar when extended to the totality of our life, to embracing dukkha, to being totally open to the experience of oneself and others, to be unflinching, to be totally honest in an awareness of what is actually going on, not only inside me here, but in this world that we share with others right now. The practice of the first noble truth is the practice of being totally open to uh, life itself. In the taking of a photograph, we try to let go of our habitual views and perceptions and cliched images. And in the same way, in the practice of the four noble tasks, we seek to let go of grasping and craving, greed and hatred and delusion. And the way I understand this is that in embracing dukkha, in being totally there with the world, that is actually the condition that in a way sees through the pettiness and often the absurdity of our attachments and our narcissism and our greed and our fear. The third step in the taking of a photograph is to release the shutter. In other words, to stop, click. And this, I think, is very similar to the stopping of craving, the stopping of grasping, even momentarily. I'm not thinking here so much of some final permanent state, but those moments when we find that that reactive patterning has stopped. It's like the pressing of the shutter, the decisive moment. And that's not an end in itself. That actually is the beginning of the path. So just as a pressing the shutter opens up an image of the world in a way that we've never quite seen it that way before, in the same way, the stopping of grasping of egoism allows us to respond to the world in ways that we could not have anticipated or could not have foreseen. And that is a process that the Buddha encourages us to bring into being. The word is bhavana. Sometimes I think rather poorly translated as meditation or development, mental development is how Bhikkhu Bodhi translates it. But actually the word bhavana uh, goes back to the root bu, which is to be, a cognate of the English word to be. Bhavar is being or existence. Bhavana means to bring something into being, to cultivate. And so the practice of the path is the cultivation of a way of life. And that cultivation of a way of life is rooted in those moments when we're not conditioned or determined by our greed, hatred, delusion, and so on. So in other words, the practice is a creative process. And the path that opens up is an unimpeded, empty space. Remember that for Nagarjuna, shunyata, or emptiness, is synonymous to the middle way itself. Emptiness is not some sort of abstract metaphysical idea, but actually it's talking about a way of being in the world in which we have emptied ourselves of what resists the emergence of another way of being in the world. In other words, greed, hatred, delusion, craving. The problem with these things is not that they cause suffering, although often, of course, they do, but I think more deeply, um, craving is a problem because it impedes or it uh, prevents the free, unimpeded movement of the path itself. Again, we can't say this in English, but really we should uh, use a word more like path thing rather than the path. You can do that in Pali and Sanskrit. So awakening, therefore, is an ongoing process. 
and not so much the achievement of a some sort of transcendent mystical insight, although, of course, that could necessarily be an integral part of that process, but not an end in itself. And so these examples, I think, help us understand the Dharma as an art of the imagination, that we're constantly challenged to respond to the world in ways that we could not perhaps have conceived in the past. We need freshness, we need originality, we need a kind of spontaneity to respond to life rather than feeling that as a Buddhist we have to behave in this way or that way or another way. A sort of a legalistic notion of this is the right way to behave. So the self or the world is a project to be realized, a work in progress, not something to be negated or denied. Uh, I think it's actually um, problematic to translate anatta as no self. I think it more correctly would be translated as not self. Uh, that the khandas, the body, the feelings, the perceptions and so on are not me. But that doesn't mean that I don't exist. What it points to is that the self is not a fixed thing that either does or doesn't exist, but the self, like the Dharma, like the elephant, is a living, organic, unfolding process. And to conclude, I'd like to uh, cite um, a verse from the Dhammapada, verse uh, 80, where the Buddha says, Just as a farmer irrigates his field, just as a fletcher fashions an arrow, just as a carpenter shapes a piece of wood, Atanam Dhammati Pandita, the wise person tames the self. Atanam, accusative. In other words, the self is not denied, but the self is compared to a field, an arrow, a block of wood that can be worked on. It can be irrigated, it can be fashioned, it can be carved, it can be sculpted. And this to me is a a wonderful um, image of how we might understand our practice. It's not about getting rid of me or the self. It's certainly about letting go of a certain fixed notion of self, but that allows us to open up to our experience as a process that is continuously unfolding, and our practice, like that of an artist, is the practice of irrigating ourselves, fashioning ourselves, shaping ourselves, and by implication, irrigating the world, fashioning the world, shaping the world. Atta and loka, self-world, are often used somewhat interchangeably. So that is really all I have to say. I hope I've stuck more or less to the theme. And we still have about 10 or 12 minutes in which I'd be happy to respond to any questions that you may have. Yes? I, I have a very simple question. I was wondering if you had practiced mixed song or contemplative photography, and what are your thoughts on that practice? Mix song? Mix song, it means good eye, mix song oh, right. photography. Mix song, yeah. yeah. Do I pla practice contemplative photography? Well, have you, and, and what are your thoughts on that practice? Well, um, I, did actually, I, was actually, I did actually see a book that was published by Shambhala recently on contemplative photography, and the author or authors of it, um, while it was still in the galley-proof stage, discovered that I also did photography, and they contacted me with the possibility of writing a blurb. And I, I looked at this book, and I was, very act I was very, very happy to see this, because I feel that although I wouldn't have used the word contemplative photography, yeah. that's basically what I was doing. Yes, that's, I suppose one would call it that. But I'm always a little bit wary of um, describing an artistic work um, in terms of some other discipline. But yes, I think what I've been saying... Um, would clearly uh, constitute a practice of photography that is deeply influenced by my Buddhist practice, that's for sure. But I, I'm uncomfortable with the idea that that produces Buddhist art. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Hi. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, you know Buddhism. Uh, each time it gets to a new culture, it adapts to lo the local um, culture mm -hmm. in terms of adaptation and assimilation. So uh, I noticed that historically speaking, Buddhism in each culture, there's a, for, for its progression and survival, there's a, there's a monastic uh, tradition. Monastic tradition, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the United States and the West, given that it's still very new, um, do you believe that monastic, monasticism is still a necessity here in, in the West? That's I think it's, I mean, I can't really answer that question. I don't know. I think it's too early to say. But I do think we have to acknowledge that monasticism was a form that evolved in Asia um, to some considerable degree because of the social and economic conditions of uh, pre-modern Asian societies. Um, monastic institutions often like us to, uh, to, to, to pro project the idea that there's something inherently spiritual about being a monk or a nun. I don't think that's true. Um, I've lived in monasteries as a monk, um, and I found that Buddhist monasteries are in many ways not places where the spiritual cream of the society is sort of ladled off. And, <laughs> but actually, a Buddhist monastery is a microcosm of the society. As people um, levitate and stuff. Sorry? As people levitate around and stuff. No, you actually find it's only a small minority within any <laughs> monastic institution who will actually be dedicated to, say, meditation. Um, I'm not sure that... I think the social and economic conditions of our time, the fact that we have general uh, education and we have considerable amount of leisure, um, the circumstances are so different today that I feel it's quite open to question as to whether Buddhism will need to perpetuate monastic traditions as a kind of uh, necessity for the survival of the Dhamma. Um, I, I, one of the interesting usages uh, that one hears a lot is that um, it's often said that you know, the, the monks and the nuns are described as, as the Sangha, that's very common in Buddhist societies, but you never find that usage in the early canon. When the Buddha describes the Sangha, he describes it in terms of what he calls the eight types of individuals. In other words, the stream entrant, the once returner, the non-returner, and the arans. In other words, the Sangha is not defined by your lifestyle, by taking certain vows. The Sangha is defined by the degree to which you have given your life to the realization of certain values, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And the Buddha speaks of a fourfold Sangha, monks, nuns, lay men, lay women. And I think it would be good to try to recover something of that early notion of Sangha um, and to see how in our time the, the needs of each practitioner can best be met. Do we need to have monastic orders and does that somehow give you some advantage or not? Um, I think that's um, an open question. I don't have an answer. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you about the concept of identifying oneself as a Buddhist and what that means in relation to your perspective on letting go of the beliefs as the definition of practice and I, I I don't like to identify myself as a Buddhist I don't that's I'm kind of here despite it being called Buddhist geeks rather than because of um, but I just I love the practices I I think I'm as enthusiastic a practitioner as anybody mm. but it took me quite a while to find a teacher who <clears throat> was really worked for me, which was Shinzen Young. Mm. Um, and I really like your approach uh, and how you describe it about not emphasizing beliefs and emphasizing a form of art and practice and something very fluid and evolving. How for you does that relate to the idea of saying I am a Buddhist mm. versus saying Buddhism is a form of practice that I participate in, 
and maybe I recommend and mm -hmm. enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm often asked this question, and I think there's a lot of people who'd be perfectly happy if I didn't call myself a Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> But perhaps because of that, I do call myself a Buddhist. <laughs> uh, I, I think I would be deeply dishonest if I said I wasn't a Buddhist, because my whole life, uh, at least since the age of 19, has been steeped in the Buddhist tradition. I've done nothing else. Um, it's, it's the source of, of, of my whole, uh, my work, uh, everything. And I feel I have to acknowledge that. I'm also uncomfortable with the word Buddhism. I'm not very happy with that. It's a term that was only, uh, it, was, it was coined in the early 19th century. There's no equivalent word for Buddhism in Tibetan or Chinese or Pali. Um, one is a follower of the Dhamma or a follower of the Buddha. Um, and perhaps over time we might be able to evolve a language whereby we can jettison these ism words altogether, and to think of oneself as a practitioner of the Dhamma. Well, that is how I'd like to see it, really. Um, but I do think we need to acknowledge, or I feel I need to acknowledge, my indebtedness uh, to this tradition. And um, also, there is a sort of an idea in the West that we don't need these labels anymore. We don't, why do you labor yourself with this Buddhist label? Why don't you just drop it? And if you do so, then you'd be free to be yourself, as it were. But I think that's a, that's a, um, a mistake. I don't think, I think someone else mentioned this. If I were to drop the word Buddhist or Buddhism, essentially I would find myself as being described as a secular humanist, probably. Uh, I don't think you can ever step out of tradition. I think it's an egotistic illusion to think that you can live independently of tradition. Um, if you're... Like, Secular humanism is probably the tradition that most non-religious people in the West would actually belong to, although even though they wouldn't declare themselves as such. And so I feel more comfortable, and I feel more honest to myself, and I also feel uh, uh, an ability to somehow uh, bring to other people, through my writings and through my work, um, the richnesses of the Buddhist tradition. And that is my vocation in this life. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, so uh, I generally have found myself in very much the same boat as the gentleman in front of me. And uh, I guess, you know, sort of beyond, beyond the question of I identity and, and labels and stuff like that, um, I'm curious uh, what perhaps experience or at least ideas you may have about what a, a community, a body of discourse, community of practice uh, around, uh, around you know, d Buddhism could be, which sort of has perhaps a healthier relationship uh, in managing the tensions between uh, preser uh, preserving uh, uh, the, the value of, you know, what is sort of calcified within tradition versus, uh, you know, the, the inherent necessity for individual reinterpretation and reimagination. So you tr what sort of community would best serve that purpose? Yeah, yeah, I'm curious if, mm. if there are waypoints that you've noticed or Way, if perhaps... Waypoints? Yeah, yeah, points of reference. If there, okay. if there are, I think, you know, perhaps communities uh, or bodies of discourse which, I, which you think uh, have ha managed this relation, this tension in a healthier way or which, you know, in, insofar as you've been thinking mm. about this, if you have ideas of what it would look mm. like. Um, well, first of all, I think one has to think of, I find it helpful to think of community not as something that you, you join or something that you find, but as something that you create. Right. Community, uh, for me, is a practice. And it's a practice of basically forging and developing friendships and connections and relationships and actually working at that. Uh, there's a sense that, uh, you, know, I, you know, you join a Buddhist Sangha and then you'll somehow experience community, not necessarily. Um, and I think I found it helpful following from uh, an idea I read in Martin Buber, the distinction between a collective and a community. A collective is a group of people who are bound together by a common ideology, and to be a part of that collective 
requires that you toe the party line. And if you depart from the party line, you're ejected from the group. That's a collective. A community, for me, is um, uh, a network or a set of friendships and relationships that serve the individuation of each member of the community. I don't see a conflict between becoming, as well, realizing one's potential as an individual and belonging to uh, and being an active and participant within a community. I think community lives through the nurturing and the development of relationships that helps each person, uh, in a way, realize their own potential and values and goals. And so I'm supported by the others in that community, and hopefully what I do can help support them. That would be my ideal. In practice, I think we, again, people ask me this all the time, you have to make use of what's available. It's like the raft analogy again. If you live in Idaho, in the middle of nowhere somewhere, and you're looking for a community, you take what's available. You, 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 you look around and find what you can get. It might be that you join a Quaker group. It might be that you join some Buddhist group who you don't necessarily totally agree with in every respect. I don't think that matters. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be creative here, and if we can't find a community that suits us, create your own. In other words, you know, put a notice in your local health food store saying, my, med meditation at 6 o'clock every Thursday at my place, see what happens. <laughs> so again, it's, 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 an, it's a work in progress. Yeah. And I can't define what would be more or less suited to that. I think each of us have to find our own way and be willing to you know, take risks, um, to recognize and accept that most or many communities are, are imperfect in some way. And, and just, you know, work on that. And well, and beyond the, the question of institutionality and, and uh, mm. personal, you know, collect, collectivity, um, what about the, the sort of issue of discourse and how to, how to communicate in a way which both preserves the knowledge and, and also facilitates and, and encourages mm. this, this Well, that again is, is a work in progress. And, and I, think, I, don't think the, I don't think the Dharma will actually, uh, in a way, engage or enter into our society unless it can uh, find an idiom, a way of speech that is both truthful to the sources of the tradition, but also is speaking the language of our time. And that's, I think you can historically, that's what happened in Tibet, in China, every, everywhere Buddhism went. There was a period, usually of 100 or 200 years or more, before an indigenous form of the Dhamma emerged in which there was the, some sort of magical moment, a point where your discourse is rooted in the tradition and at the same time speaks in an authentic and lucid and engaged way in the idiom of your culture and your time. Um, we've kind of run out of time, but if it's quick. It can be an open question. Um, how would you, you, you mentioned something about, and I might be paraphrasing, empowering um, communities of practice to interpret the Dharma and to make it a living, mm -hmm. a living uh, a path or whatever for, for themselves. So how would you recommend the, the people in this room uh, use their experience and their power and their resources and energy to empower communities to keep things alive and you know yeah it's it's an open question <laughs> uh well one one word answer wisely <laughs> and compassionately maybe we have to end here yeah. thank you